So I'm here with Jane Glover, who is the conductor for our upcoming production of Albert Herring. In a career spanning six decades, Glover has collaborated with some of the most notable artists of our day, including Jesse Norman, Heather Harper, Janet Baker, and Peter Serkin, and performed at many of the great opera houses and orchestra halls around the world. She's the author of Mozart's Women and more recently Handel in London. Jane, so great to see you again. Good to see you, Andy. I've missed you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. We miss you here. Jane's back in London and I'm in Minneapolis, for those of you wondering where we are right now. Um, in your career, you've become known for your scholarship and interpretations of the operas of Handel and Mozart, but you have a particularly strong and personal connection to Benjamin Britten. Could you please tell us a bit about your association with Britten? Oh, well, um, I, I met him when I was 16. It's a very formative, formative age at which to meet your musical hero, because by then he certainly was. I had chanced upon his music really growing up in the sticks as I did. Uh, although I was a musical child, I didn't have much access to great music at, uh, at a high level. Um, but I did have access to hear his, his music through hearing an early performance of the War Requiem. And, and I played in new orchestras and, and that sort of thing. So I got hold of as much music of his as I could. So when I met him, when I was 16, he and Piers came to do a recital in the small town where I lived. Um, and he slightly um, took me under his wing in the two or three days they spent in, uh, in the area. Um, I met them several times. And, you know, Andy, it's often said that Britain was very encouraging to musical boys. Well, I can tell you he was jolly encouraging to this musical girl too. Um, and uh, he gave me tickets to Peter Grimes uh, at Sadler's Wells when it was my birthday the following week. And, uh, and he invited me to Alborough on the apprentice scheme when I was in that gap between school and university. And um, I, I, I mean, I was never a close associate of him, but um, I, I just always adored his music. And whenever I conduct it, it feels like coming home. That's amazing. That's amazing. So just to give our audience some background information about the opera, with hopefully not divulging any spoilers, Albert Herring takes place in a small town in the English countryside in 1900. The opera opens at the home of Lady Billows, a wealthy dowager and self-appointed arbiter of morality in the town. And it's her hope to revive the custom of choosing a young woman with a spotless reputation to represent the community as May Queen, but to her dismay, the girls in the town fall well short of her standards of morality, having committed cardinal sins like answering the door in a nightgown and wearing skirts that are too short. After having gone through and rejected all the local girls, the town constable suggests choosing instead a young man known for his innocence and virtue named Albert Herring. Left with no other options, Lady Billows decides that instead of a May Queen, they will choose a May King. The plan ultimately backfires when Albert's lemonade is spiked with rum at the May Day ceremony, inspiring him to go off on a bender to find out all about the sins that his overbearing mother had been shielding him from for his entire life. So Jane, what do you think that this particular story, why do you think this story resonated with Britain enough for him to give it the operatic treatment? Um, interesting question, Andy. Um, because in a way, it's a sort of silly story except it comes from Maupassant, who was a very serious writer. Um, but uh, as we all know, great opera composers can make great operas out of silly stories. I mean, look at Così Fan Tutte, for instance. Um, it's the best example I can think of. But um, actually, it's one of those stories which is about an outsider who finds his own way in life. And if you think about all Britain's operas, actually, they all somehow include an outsider who is either finding his way in life or not. Um, Peter Grimes never really did. Um, uh, Billy Budd never really did. Um, uh, you can even say that uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth is the outsider in Gloriana. Um, I guess she did, but uh, uh, Albert Herring certainly does. And this is one of the sort of feel good operas. But along the way, uh, again, like all good opera composers, Britain subjects his audience to a great deal of thought provoking 
action, um, which uh, is actually very, very moving. And, um, you know, the, the, the one sympathizes with Albert in the face of all these awful people. I mean, the, most of the, of the townspeople uh, who are involved in this May Day ceremony are, are flawed in some way. They're, the only really nice person is, is the, young, uh, the young girl, Nancy, who uh, is nice to everybody. Um, and uh, it's, there, as I say, there was something of, of, of th that Britain responded to about the, you know, the man on his own. Uh, of course, it, it, we talked a lot about this in rehearsal, the fact that when he wrote Albert Herring um, for his, his partner, Peter Pierce, to sing, uh, you know, the whole issue of, of, of homosexuality was, was uh, illegal. Um, and so anybody who was a homosexual was an, out, was an outsider. Now, this is not to say that Albert Herring indeed is gay because he isn't, um, but it, it's something that in, in various forms, uh, the whole thing of the outsider, I mean, the governess in the turn of the screw is an outsider, complete outsider. Um, so he can write outsiders of either sex, either tragically or comically. Um, and what he shows in this opera, as he does in Midsummer Night's Dream, but not much in many of the others, is that he's brilliant at comedy, as well as um, making you um, think and, um, and making you weep, which we certainly do at, at certain stages in Albert Herring. It's got the lot, really. It's got the lot. So um, Minnesota Opera will be streaming this opera starting on May 22nd. And there have been a few telecasts of Albert Herring over the years, which have made make this production doubly special. The only commercially available DVD of this opera comes from the Glyndebourne Festival in the UK, which is also where the opera was premiered. And that production featured a stellar, stellar cast and was directed by Peter Hall and conducted by Bernard Heitink. And I believe you were involved in that production. I'm just wondering if you could share your experiences working on that production and how it shaped your understanding of this opera. Um, I, not, I, not only did I work on it, I mean, I assisted Bernard Heiting on it and he did the first six performances or something and I then did the rest of the run. And the following year when it was revived, it was all mine. So I, I have deep connection with that production of, Al, of, uh, of Albert Herring by Peter Hall. And of course, any time one worked with the great Sir Peter, it was a sort of, it was just brilliant. He, is, he was so good at character. He was so good at situation. And um, he could do comedy and he could do tragedy and all those things we've just talked about. But um, as I think I said in rehearsal, one of the great notes he kept giving to everybody was never try and be funny. You have to be real. These people are saying these things because they mean it and because they're, they're thinking it. It has to be real. As soon as you think this is funny, it doesn't become funny. And that was a great lesson for everybody, I think. And something that, that Doug, our director, was, was also very, very keen on, that, that nobody tried to camp it up or play for laughs. Not that we had an audience to whom to play for laughs, but um, it, it is quite easy to get carried away into something that is caricature and therefore uh, shallow as opposed to real and therefore profound. Right, and that actually um, reminds me of a story you were telling us about Janet Baker, who you are very close with, um, about her association with this opera and having worked on it with Britain. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, funnily enough, it was the same note. Uh, she was playing Nancy in a production in, um, uh, in Aldborough, actually, in Britain's own town. And, and he came into a rehearsal and, and said exactly the same to the cast that Peter Hall had said to, our, to us, my, our lot, you know, don't try and be funny, just, just be real. So it was the same thing, same note. Yeah. Um, and for this opera, Britain uses a much smaller orchestration of 12 players. Um, just can you talk a little bit about that setup, where it came from, what the inspiration behind it was, and what the benefits of having so few players are? Well, it's interesting. Um, uh, yes, as you say, the 12 players plus the pianist who plays the recitatives, which in many cases is the conductor. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's, it, obviously it's economy. And in this COVID age, this was perfect for us to have an orchestra, not of 64 or even 44, but just, as you say, 12 people spread out. But it's sort of got, a, it's, a, it's a string quintet plus uh, one of each wins, 
um, and one horn, no trumpets, no nothing too brassy, plus a harp. And uh, it's extraordinary how you can um, get it actually enormous amounts of sound out of that combination of instruments, uh, as well as immense delicacy. And um, uh, he liked this combination, which he invented for this opera. Oh, oh wait a minute, did Rape of Lucretia come first? I think uh, it did, yeah. Yes, he'd done it in Rape of Lucretia, absolutely, in during the war in in Glyndebourne. No, just after the war in Glyndebourne. And then liked it so much, he did Albert Herring, and then Turn of the Screw, absolutely, the same orchestration. And then, even more noticeably, the chamber orchestra in the War Requiem that he wrote at the beginning of the 60s, where you have a massive orchestra compared to um, uh, uh, th this small orchestra that, we, that which he adored, which um, could also combine with the big one in, in the War Requiem, but 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 it have its own timbre and its own resonances. And um, with that, it, it, it's it's amazing how much noise you can make, um, and yet you have immense variety. And even though it's numerically small scale, it's by no means small in impact it's uh, you, you can have huge impact from small forces just as with big forces you can sometimes think eh. <laughs> what struck me i think most about hearing the orchestration is how everybody is a soloist Thank and you. by virtue of the fact that they're a soloist um each individual player took on character in a way that they don't often do um when doing the normal orchestra setup Indeed, absolutely. I mean, he does do that a bit in some of the bigger orchestrations in something like Midsummer Night's Dream, for instance. There's a lot of sort of instrumental um, um, identification with certain roles, you know, uh, Puck and the trumpet, for instance, in, in, in Midsummer Night's Dream and so on. But here, absolutely, um, uh, the way he uses, and, and as you say, every, every single member of that orchestra is a soloist. And uh, some perhaps more than others, but uh, uh, you know they all have their moment in the sun. Uh, for which reason I think instrumental players love to play this music because it's great responsibility for them as well, and they do feel part of the ensemble. Even in this COVID time, when you know we weren't particularly, um, we were of course in the same building and in, on the same stage as the cast, but but there were all these COVID rules that they had to sing away from us and all this sort of thing. So they never actually got to appreciate seeing the singers in the way that uh, they sometimes do. Um, and yet I think everybody felt hugely committed to, to the project as always. Yeah. So just to give sort of the audience a background, we did not have the normal setup where the orchestra is in the pit. Um, the singers were on stage and then the orchestra was behind them. So we were all on the same levels, on the same level. And in some way, I think that kind of connected everybody a little bit more, maybe on some level too. I mean, there was yes. a disconnect as well. Uh, well, in, in that, I mean, I don't know if you've got time to talk about the COVID rules, but you know, even the, the relationship of the singers to each other on the stage is that they had to have four feet between them and they couldn't and if they were singing in the each in towards each other it had to be 12 feet i think i mean and the, so that with a cast of 12 people or whatever it is um that's uh, that's a lot of space that you've got to create and i think doug schultz castle our, our brilliant director did an absolutely wonderful job at um at, at creating the space that was needed for for the covid regulation um and yet making something intimate of it. I mean, the, spectacularly, of course, there is an embrace um, in the second act of, of, of Albert Herring, and I won't spoil this for the audience, but it's, it's, it's done with complete um, obedience to COVID laws, and yet you get an embrace. So watch out for that. So uh, what is your favorite moment from this opera? Oh, there are so many, Andy. That's, uh, um, um, I mean, I, I, that, I'm not even sure I could, could say. I mean, there are some of the naughty moments, like the quotations from Wagner, which just make, make one laugh like anything. I mean, I think the, the, the massive threnody at, in the third act, when everybody thinks that poor Albert is dead, 
um, and sing this great lament. And this, of course, was particularly poignant for us singing these words, you know, in the midst of life is death, death awaits us one and all. To sing that during a, a pandemic. And, and actually, the added poignancy of, um, of of doing all this during the, the the Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis, when we were all very much thinking about George Floyd, and uh, you know he died too soon, and that, these words come up also in the Threnody, and these were these, these hit you in the solar plexus as being incredibly relevant. Um, as those sort of words always do in, you know, whenever one hears words like fear no more, the heat of the sun, it's, these are not just for one person at a particular funeral, it's about the whole of mankind. And so this threnody, I think, is, is incredible. And it, it's sort of a unison ensemble, except that individual voices emerge from it with individual lines. It's a great, great piece of writing. Um, but there are other things that I, I adore. For instance, um, um, this, this, he was just so brilliant at orchestration. Even uh, uh, three instruments, uh, uh, a flutter tongue flute and a flutter tongue horn and a glockenspiel to indicate the whirring of a, a cuckoo clock and then the uh, striking of the cuckoo clock. But to get the sort of brrr, get that sort of whir before the cuckoo does its strike was is genius about three instruments. Or the other thing is which you know I love, Andy, is the um, is the fairground music, the 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 the, the music that uh, when when Mrs. Herring says that there's a photograph that was taken of her son on the pier at Felixstowe, and suddenly we get this pier music, this fairground music of of, of a summer. Um, day at the beach, you know, and, and sort of squeaky um, fairground machinery. And it's just a brilliant piece of orchestration that, that makes you smile. It was took on the pier at Felixstowe when his dad was alive in a studio. We paid three and six to have it enlarged and another three bob for the frame and the glass. But there were so many, those are some of my favorites. So as I mentioned, you're back in London now and uh, you've been there for a week and I understand you're still quarantining, um, having just returned from a foreign country. I'm just wondering, you know, given that you're at home right now and have had a chance to reflect on this experience, how was it for you? What did it mean to you to be making music again? Oh. With actual musicians and stage directors, etc. cetera. Um, as you know, uh, Andy, I, I, I was in America for eight weeks um, and did concerts in Chicago and Houston, as well as working on this opera for a long time. We had a lovely long rehearsal period before we spent a week to film it and in Minneapolis and everywhere I went, I, I just found the, um, the, the attitude of musicians, singers or, or players to being back in a rehearsal room again was just so joyful and so grateful and so intense and so energetic. Um, it, was, I, it was absolutely, absolutely amazing and I felt that certainly on the first day that we had in the rehearsal room here were all our singers masked to the hilt even the singers 
have to have to and they you know the, the wonderful minnesota opera made these special masks for the singers so they, they had little frames so they weren't actually sucking in fabric every time they inhaled which is what we all find we're doing do we not with these beastly masks um and and uh, you know they were nobody complained about that nobody complained about the rules of the of the um uh, of the covid separation and all that everybody just desperate to make it work and just fundamentally so happy to be back uh, as I was I was ecstatic actually I mean of course it was incredibly hard work and we had our challenges enormous challenges um, all sorts of challenges at many levels but fundamentally um, it was a completely wonderful experience I hope you felt the same. I did. It felt like a homecoming in so many different ways. And I can't think of a better opera to have facilitated that homecoming than Albert Herring, which is just a really special story and incredibly intricate, subtle, grand, over the top. It really has everything that you want in an opera. And it was such a pleasure to work on it with you and to um, just experience your experience with this show. Well, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It was, um, um, it's the only place I wanted to be. Yeah. Jane, thank you so much for uh, meeting with me. And I hope that we see each other again very soon. And we'll see everybody else at the premiere of Albert Herring on May 22nd.